All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, MWY panel series event. On behalf of the superintendent of the United States Military Academy, Lieutenant General Robert L. Caslin, and the Commandant of the United States Military Academy, Brigadier General Diana M. Holland, and the Modern War Institute, uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, we're really excited to welcome Mr. Dennis Rodman, Mr. Chris Vo, and Dr. Joe Twilliger, uh, as well as Colonel Leon Collins, who are here to discuss alternative diplomacy with us today. Our first guest is Mr. Dennis Rodman. He is a second round draft pick in 1986. Uh, Rodman went on to become one of the league's dominant all-time rebounders, and he helped lead the Detroit Pistons and later the Chicago Bulls to multiple championships. He was inducted into the NBA Hall of Fame in 2011, and he visited the Democratic People's Republic of Korea uh, and met with Kim Jong-un in 2014. Our second guest is Mr. Chris Volo. Chris Volo is Dennis Rodman's agent and has been with the, Pri the Prince Marketing Group since 2012. Dr. Twilliger, uh, is a professor of neurobiology at the Sergeyevsky Center and uh, studies genetics at Columbia University. Dr. Twilliger accompanied uh, Mr. Rodman to DPRK in 2014 and has visited many other countries as part of his genetic research, including China, Kazakhstan, Denmark, and Venezuela. Our moderator today is Colonel Liam Collins. He's the director of the Modern War Institute and the former director of both the Defense and Strategic Studies Program and the Combating Terrorism, Terrorism Center here at West Point. Please join me in welcoming our panelists for today's discussion. All right, I, I've heard some people ask, why do you have Dennis Rodman coming to West Point? What could you possibly learn from him? And my response is, you never know what you can learn from somebody, uh, but if you have that attitude, you probably do have nothing to learn. Uh, the somewhat uh, other question, the other somewhat related question I've heard is, wh why is the Modern War Institute at West Point bringing Dennis Rodman to talk? And I expect that question we answered after my introductory remarks here. So one thing that has been present since the start of politics and war is the fact that third party actors, those not acting in official capacity or on behalf of the state, can influence state actions. This in impact could be positive or negative and can range from the tactical to the strategic level or both. With cell phones, internet, modern social media, the ability of third party actors to have an impact is only increased. Why is this relevant to the cadets in the audience? Because you're the ones that will be deployed somewhere and likely to benefit or suffer from the actions of an individual half a world away. And if you aren't staying abreast of what's going on in the world, then this can have serious repercussions for your actions. In 1972, during the Vietnam War, Jane Fonda visited North Vietnam and had her picture taken in front of an anti-aircraft gun. This picture rapidly spread via TV and print media, the only kind that existed at the time. To, th to this day, she's despised by many uh, Vietnam vets, but with modern social media, the impact can be much larger. To show how things have changed, some cadets in the audience may remember Terry Jones, the Florida pastor who first announced his plans to burn Korans on Twitter in 2010, and subsequently promoted it on Facebook and YouTube, which drew international outcry. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton responded by saying it's regrettable that a pastor in Gainesville, Florida, with a church of no more than 50 people, can make this outrageous and distressful, disgraceful plan and get the world's attention. General Petraeus, as commander of ISAF in Afghanistan, was also critical, and President Obama remarked, you could have serious violence in places like Pakistan or Afghanistan. This could increase the recruitment of individuals who would be willing to blow themselves up in American cities or European cities. So prior to social media, if he held a burning, it is doubtful anybody outside of Gainesville, Florida would have known. So now I'll move to the strategic level. North Korea is a top geopolitical and security concern for the United States, but lacking an embassy, we lack formal diplomatic channels, and trips like Rodman's can offer the potential for what's been called creative diplomacy, two-track diplomacy, or ping-pong diplomacy. The last phrase refers to the use of table tennis championship in East Asia, in the early 1970s to set the stage for Nixon's historic visit to mainland China. Lacking official diplomatic channels makes miscommunication or mis misperception much more likely. Robert Jervis and other scholars have written about how this can lead to confirmation bias, cognitive distortions, which are only aggravated in times of crisis. 
Thus, diplomacy with difficult adversaries often relies on unofficial envoys, such as Bill Richardson or Jesse Jackson, who, in their unofficial capacity, can act more effectively as intermediaries, whether to free hostages or convey a, uh, convey a set of demands. Now I'll turn to Rodman's trip to North Korea. His first trip took place in February of 2013. He's been criticized for calling Kim Jong-un a friend for life, but relationships like his with the North Korean leader can have real results. When Rodman visited North Korea, an American named Kenneth Bay was serving a 15-year sentence of hard labor for committing unspecified hostile acts in the country and was the longest held U.S. citizen in North Korea since the Korean War. Without simplifying what is undoubtedly a complicated situation in the world's most opaque country, Rodman's visit to North Korea certainly influenced the leader, and it isn't beyond reason uh, that Bay's release after 735 days in the Gulag had some connection with them. To be fair, some of Rodman's public, public comments about Bay were highly controversial, but Bay himself thanked Rodman and credited Rodman for being, in his own words, a catalyst for my release. Around the same time, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl was being held captive by the Haqqani Network in Afghanistan or Pakistan, with U.S. officials working for his release. It took nearly five years for him to be released as part of a prisoner exchange for five Taliban members held at Guantanamo Bay. This begs the question of whether non-traditional diplomacy options were utilized, and if not, would they have been more effective? Thus, you cadets in the audience need to understand how independent actors such as Rodman or Pastor Terry Jones could impact your efforts. So hopefully this puts this into perspective a little more. Now I'll turn to our panelists. So Dennis, you're a piston area bad boy. I'm not uh, talk now. <laughs> uh, give, give, yes, exactly. I gotta talk. <laughs> a little bit. So you got a pretty cool nickname, the Worm. Five-time NBA <laughs> champion, NBA Hall of Famer, probably yep. put a tattoo artist in college. <laughs> yep. So tell us a little bit about Dennis. Why? How did this guy from Trenton <clears throat> went to Cook County Junior College in southeastern Oklahoma State? Well, you know, um, living in Dallas, Texas, um, my father, I, I lived in Germany for like two years. My dad was in the Army over in Germany. Then he went over to the Philippines for like 35 years. But uh, we moved to Dallas in 1961 and um, lived in, you know, in the ghetto, like most you know, black people in the 60s and 70s. And uh, mother worked four jobs. Um, I was a bum, you know. <laughs> I was in and out of jail every other week. And uh, for some reason, reason I, um, when I graduated high school, I was only five foot seven. So at the age of 20, I, I was like six foot seven, <laughs> so so six foot seven. So, and that, that growing spurt. So, uh, I just started playing basketball at that time when I was twenty years old, and I just got very very lucky. And people actually gave me the opportunity to go play basketball. So, how did that how did that make you successful? Just you had the opportunity, and you were were good at it. Well, going to a school in southeast Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, so. Um, it, it was pretty much a racist town. It was like uh, 22,000 people, um, not too many blacks. I'd say maybe 10, 15 at the most. So going to a school like that, I didn't have no clue because coming from the projects and going to a, a, a racist city like that, I had no clue, I had no clue. I saw it in, in, in 67 when Martin Luther King died and it was riots in, in the neighborhood you know, we in the black community took outrage, and they saw any white person that come to the neighborhood, they would just do anything they could to, to, to get back. What they, what they thought was like uh, racism. So I, that's all I knew then. But once I went to Oklahoma, it kind of it kind of came back to me. I said, Wow, I thought this was over. You know, I thought this you know, racism was over, but it wasn't. But uh, I think that just because I play basketball and people start to to uh, warm up to me and and all of a sudden, things start to light up for me. All right, so Dr. Torliger, uh, uh, I'll turn to you. So you're kind of the opposite in Dennis in just about every way, at least uh, <laughs> physically. Uh, I, but, I'm pretty unusual also. But I was going to say, but, but you're also un a uniquely successful outlier like Dennis. Uh, you're a pro tuba player. You've rolled with the New York City Opera and have another cool title. You play with the, tub the Tubonic Plague Tuba Quartet. <laughs> <laughs> You, 
you've, so you've made a name for yourself playing uh, Lincoln impersonator or, or, and, or placing second in a Nathan's hot dog eating contest. That's right, yep. <laughs> Yet somehow. Missed it by that much, one bite. <laughs> it could have been somebody. <laughs> Right, but yet somehow you find time for your, your day job as a statistical geneticist at Columbia University and that occasionally hangs out in North Korea. So well, that's a real interesting s story, sound like an interesting superhero. So can you tell us a little bit more about the origin of your story? Yeah, I mean, um, I grew up actually not far from here in Ulster County, also in a, a relatively poor community. We had, I was the first person in my family to even go to college. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of opportunities in my life because of music and science and other things. And my real interest in this sort of exchange sort of thing happened when I was in college. I, I did my undergrad at the Peabody Conservatory of Music in, in Baltimore. And um, we were the first um, student orchestra to visit the Soviet Union back in 1987. And so it was an initial sort of this sort of cultural diplomacy experience and it really had an impact on me because we went to the Soviet Union and you see these things that are very different from what you expect. You know, and you realize that people everywhere are kind of basically have the same, they, they live the same way, they have the same ideas and it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of misunderstandings that we have when we, when we approach the world. So I've, you know, throughout my career as a geneticist, um, which happened because I didn't, I wanted to come to New York to do music, but they pay you to go to school if you study science. So I decided I'm gonna go study science and I didn't understand the names of my classes my first year. So, you know, it was just overwhelming. But then I, I turned out that I, I was okay at it, I kinda liked it. And when you study genetics, basically if you look around this room, you see a lot of variation among people that has nothing to do with how tall you are. It has to do with where your ancestors came from and that creates a lot of genetic variation. So we have to go to the unusual parts of the world where people are much more homogeneous, where they're isolated politically, culturally, and geographically to do our research. And that brought me into Korea, into Venezuela, into a lot of other places where, well, there's more military action than there is uh, scientific action. And it's taught me over the years just that the people are the same wherever you go. And if you approach people with respect and you try to understand what's going on there, you can build relationships. And Dennis has been a great model for that. Because this guy, you know, he's all heart. And when he went over to Korea, he just listened to what they had to say, he didn't judge them. And that's how you build a relationship. And you build a relationship, then you've got trust, and then you can go somewhere. And I think that's really the importance of what this man did for, you know, for us. I guess, I, I guess we'll ask you how, did the, you, know, how did the first trip start? I mean, is that Chris or Joe or? I wasn't there. But, so how did the, <laughs> what was the origin of the first trip, and then how did you two well, get the, linked up then? The first trip started when, um, Vice Media contacted us to have the Globetrotters go over there and they wanted Dennis to participate. Then, uh, you know, once he went over there with the first trip, then we organized, you know, a second trip to try to have Dennis's own, you know, basketball game over there, which we, uh, which we succeeded. You know, so that's, yeah. So really started with Vice in the second trip, and so how did how did Dennis? How did you get linked in with with Joe? Did uh, did Joe call you up? Uh, you know this tuba player, uh, geneticist. As you know, he's he's he's, he's somewhat like a geek, right? It's a nerd. <laughs> so is he, actually. <laughs> pretty much, right? Pretty much. So. No, we are. I think it was more like we hooked up as, as a uh, contest with basketball, right? Yeah, we played horse. We, we, played, we played horse, and uh, we played horse, <laughs> me and him in New York. Yeah, Professor Joe won a raffle to, the, to play. <laughs> what was that? Don't <laughs> talk to him about North Korea. Don't talk to him about North Korea. Yeah. Sports Illustrated said between the two of us, we threw up enough bricks to qualify for membership in the Masons Union. Yeah, right. That's true. Yeah, but I'm saying people always want to know about the, you know, the North Korea trip and how did I came a, a part of that. Um, I, I didn't know anything about North Korea. I knew because they see movies. You see movies. I didn't know anything about politics and stuff like that. For me, it was all about sports. Yes, sports. And my first trip when I went over there, it was actually cool. You know, I just went over there, you know, blind, like green behind the ears and stuff like that. But once you got off the plane, it was such such a welcome song for me to go over there to see these people like actually bow down to you. And people don't believe that. And um, when I went there, me and Bo went there. I mean, they just literally put out the red carpet. And I'm just like not thinking about, well, 
Oh, they're going to kidnap us. They're going to do this to us or something like that. I'm not thinking about that. I'm thinking about sports. That's all about it. And we was having dinner at the hotel. He said, the marshal's going to come see you later on today. I didn't know who this guy was. The marshal. I mean, the, like the leader, right? So next thing you know, we have this upstairs eating. Here he comes. He walks in. Don't speak any English. I mean, he just straight, you know. But um, it, it, we just hit it off pretty well. It's just, you know, just people just talking as friends. We didn't talk about no politics. We didn't talk about anything but basketball because he loved the Chicago Bulls. That's the main reason why I went over there. He loved basketball. And uh, he went to school in Switzerland, and that's all he knew was basketball. So he, uh, he, was, he, he was asking me, he said, you know what? If you do something for me, I'll do something for you. And it's a true story, right? He, he said, oh, my birthday is January 9th. I said, I agree. So we're sitting on the boat, on the boat, right? And I'm sitting right next to him. I said, OK, let me do something for you. I mean, some, something cool. I said, I said, how about January 9th, I bring a basketball team over here to play in front of your people? He said, really? He was shocked. He said, really? I said, yes, really. And it was just so odd, the fact that he actually agreed to it. He said, yes, we would love that. And the people don't really know anything about basketball, you know, they don't know anything. It's no, they know all about politics and, and the way of life. And um, so he said, you know what? Then we went back for the basketball game. He said, you know, only, this is what he said, true story. He said, you're the only American that's ever kept this word, I thank you. That's what he told me. I didn't know what he, that meant. You know, I didn't know what that, what that meant. I said, I agree. I said, I just came over because you asked me to do something, and we promised me something. And he was, he was going to promise me that he was going to give me Ken and Bay. And I think Ken and Bay was on the boat that day, but something happened. So I think that was an agreement right there, that he was going to release Ken and Bay on the boat to me to bring him back to America. And that's why I did the basketball game for him. So it's like, you know, we're not like, buddy buddies, you know, I can go with us, you know, but we are, we are more like, we do have a friendship where it's not about politics, it's about sports. Politics is for the people in Washington, D.C., and people that's in, in, in the field. I'm there for sports. I'm just gonna communicate that way. So if I can do anything to just to even try to bridge the gap, sports is the best way to do it. Yeah, so I mean, uh, so what was the most surprising thing or what unexpected thing that you s on the first trip over there? For I guess for 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 you, either of you or all three of you. How was it? Was it what you expected, or was it different than what you expected? Uh, well, I was I was obviously nervous until we landed. Then I realized, you know, we were just in a, you know, a different place. You know, not a strange place, or you know, I never, you know, I didn't feel like at any point, you know, I was in harm's way or anything. The one thing I could say about how I feel, their citizens over there look at him, is they look at him not in fear, but because they, that's the only way they know. So if we grow up, if you grow up in New York City, you grow up a Yankee fan, what are you taught to hate the Red Sox? You're a Yankee fan, so they're taught whoever they're, they're taught whoever has that position as the marshal of the country is you know the the king. He's the, he's the man, and it's not it's not out of fear. It's because they feel it's an honor to love who's in that position, and the fact that we went over there and they saw their marshal, their leader, like someone like this. How he looks like, tattoos, piercings, says what he wants. We don't like that all the time, but he says what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> he says what he wants. You don't get more American than Dennis Rodman. Yeah. And the, it's just, I hate to break it to you folks, but that, that's the truth. You don't get more American than Dennis Rodman. And the fact that they saw their leader accept him is such a huge step for both countries. I had a Secret Service agent over there saying, you know, we, we were afraid of Americans. You know, we, you know, we were raised that, you know, America was a threat. And he said to me, 
after seeing our smiles talking to us, I, I never thought I would be a friend with an American. But, you know, you guys are friends for life. And right then and there, that was such a small step, and only I was there for it. But it was such a, you know, an amazing, amazing moment for me personally, for Dennis, for Professor Joe. And I think, you know, these trips and his relationship is, is unbelievable for both countries. Um, you know, I know Dennis would do anything for President Trump, knows him personally, so, you know, we, we would go back in a second if it meant helping everybody in uniform, helping our president, helping our nation, you know, we, we would go back, you know, in a second. And just a little off topic, I want to congratulate you guys for beating Navy, because that's awesome. <laughs> And it's not going to be 14 years until you beat him again. I think you're going for two in a row. All right, so Chris cleared, clearly did his research before coming here. <laughs> so I, I guess I'll go back to the, the, the basketball trips a little bit, Dennis. So was it just kind of a you know, normal goodwill trip like any other place where you do basketball, or was this one somehow different, or was there a political part to it, or was it just kind of like the other trips you'd go elsewhere? You know, let's go back to the statement when I, you said something about, when I said something about Ken and Bay, and it, it got a lot of negative re, 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 reviews. Yeah. I really didn't say anything about Ken and Bay. I really didn't say anything about him. All I said was, word for word, I said, what did he do? That's all I said. And then when I got back, it was like maybe seven, 800 reporters at Beijing airport criticizing me that I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a traitor and this, 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 this. I'm like, wait a minute, I just came here a, a couple of months ago and you guys kissed my ass. <laughs> and all of, a, all of a sudden now, it's a whole total reversal. I'm like, wait, what happened? You know, so, so it's like, and when I went over there and then, and I, and I sung happy birthday to him, and people tripped out in America. They, 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 didn't, they didn't go crazy in the world. Everybody else in the world loved it. They loved it, but us as Americans, we just like, wait a minute, hold on, what is he doing over there? You know, it's like, you know, because he's, he's, he's supposed to be the bad guy. He's supposed to, you know, have threats and missiles and stuff like that. I didn't know anything about that. But I'm saying, you know, for me, just to be with him, to sit there side by side with him every day, hold his baby, talk to his wife, talk to his cousin and stuff like that, as, like, as friends. And we, he didn't talk about anything negative, you know, but... What you see on TV, he never talks. He rarely smiles. You know, he, he, he just, to me, he was just a normal guy. And he asked me personally, he said, I would love to come to America to go to a New York Knicks game. He actually said that to me. He wanted to come here to go one, one game. But obviously, he can't come. He'd be dead. <laughs> <laughs> We definitely keep it real in the, yeah. in the Rodman okay, camp. So, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> but basically what Dennis is saying, because I do speak Dennis fluently, yeah, so. is, you know, he brought awareness to the whole Kenneth Bay situation. Right. When we came back, you know, we wrote a letter you know, asking for, you know, his release. And, you know, within, I think a few months later, you know, we didn't get an answer on it. But within a few months later, it, you know, it happened. So, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that Dennis had a lot to do with it. You know, obviously Dennis being Dennis can get us in certain situations every once in a while. But, you know what, he's got the biggest heart. He's the realest guy. He's the most honest guy oh, yeah, to a yeah. fault but he's the most honest right. guy you know i know and he's got a huge heart and there's nothing he wouldn't do for this country i mean we we get asked questions to talk about north korea constantly i get it you know 100 emails a day the only ones you know the only one we said yes to was west point so you know it's an honor to be here you know ladies and gentlemen you are you know awesome so i personally love being here yeah <laughs> so most of these guys, you know, I don't really speak to too many people that's in the military too much, but just to come here, just to, really just to come here to walk and to drive through the, I call pearly gates, 
<laughs> well, they can't you know, it's not too poly when you're like the freshman, right? You can't leave this damn place. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you gotta stay here in, like, for one year, and then after that, you're good to go. But so it's like just to, just to come through that those gates. That really takes a lot of commitment. I mean, literally, that takes a lot of commitment. I'll keep running myself to basketball and to my kids and stuff like that. And that's hard, especially with social media. But to walk through here and walk through this premises and the grounds here, that takes a lot of commitment to be with strangers that you never met before, that you have to sit there and share your whole life with for the next four years and maybe the next 10 years. And that's commitment. That's why you, that means like you're sharing your life with people around the world that serve in the country of, of America. And you putting your life on the line for us to keep us safe around the world. And that takes a lot of commitment and a lot of dedication just to have the heart and the desire to put your life on the line. And that's, 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 that takes, it takes a lot. All right, so, so Dennis, if you talk to Kim Jong-un, if he does come to the U.S., he does not have to fear for his life. You can let him know that. <laughs> um, but so I, I, I will ask Dr. Turliger, ask you, I mean, what was your impression of, of, of Kim Jong-un? Well, I mean, so I, I've been to North Korea about 15 times. I went there studying Korean, and I've uh, been there in a lot of science exchange programs and other things like that. And going with Dennis and meeting Marshal Kim Jong-un has opened a lot of doors for me to be able to do things there that we couldn't otherwise do in terms of building a relationship of trust and, and exchange and trying to understand each other. I would say that um, when we met Marshal Kim Jong-un, he treated us like family, basically. He was very warm and welcoming to us as individuals. He opened his home and he let us in. He was friendly. He you know, was very affable with us. It was like hanging out with the guys, kind of. And it's not what I expected. I expected it would be very serious and very formal, but it was the opposite. And I mean, Dennis brings a lot of that out, because this guy can make anybody relax, you know? And I think that that's part of the charm. I wanted to say something about the earlier comment about the reaction to the game that Vo made. So I teach at the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, and I was living there the summer before we went over together. And um, the students there, had all seen the first game with the Harlem Globetrotters. And I, you know, when we're there, we live on the campus with the students. We're around them 24 hours a day, and we're having dinner with them. Like, like here in the mess hall, it would be me and a bunch of North Korean students, and we just talk freely. And the one thing every single person said is that when they saw Dennis on TV saying nice things about their country and being friendly with Kim Jong-un, they said it made them reconsider what they thought about Americans. And I think that's one of the most important things in the world about interaction with other countries, is they get to see us as people and not as caricatures. Just like for us, it's very important to remember that the people in North Korea are just like you. They have families, they have kids, what they care about is the, the well-being of their families, their homes, their children, they want a better future for themselves and everybody else. It's not different. And I think it's really important to have a little bit of empathy when we're thinking about how to solve these problems. And Dennis is a great example of that, because this man is, the, really, I, I read every book there is to read about North Korea. I also read every book there is to read about Dennis Rodman before I met him. And I'll tell you what, it didn't, it didn't prepare me for the warmth of this man and how generous he was with his time and how, how, how honest he is. He goes out and he'll talk to people and really try to show respect and understanding. And that's what makes you know, relationships work. And that's what I try to do every time I travel in a difficult part of the world, be it North Korea, be it Iran, be it Venezuela, and all these other places where I work, is that I go there and I try to show respect to people and show them that Americans are good people, and the American people are very warm, and we're eager to get along with the rest of the world, even when our governments don't. And I think that's something we all have to remember. Every time you step outside this country, you're the face of America, whether or not you're in an official capacity. And I'm very proud that this man's the face of America. All right, so Chris, you kind of talked about this before a little bit, but Dennis with his you know, erratic personality, severed, a celebrity alternate, alternative lifestyle, which may be off-putting to some Americans, uh, is precisely what gives him the ability to connect with North Korea's leadership, right? But the irony, but but the right next to you. But right. So the irony, of course, the, the irony, of course, is that right. Your lifestyle represents the embodiment of indi individual freedom, 
Absolutely. Yet mm -hmm. Kim Jong Un's name, right, has been forever associated with a country where, where freedom is a rare commodity. Uh, so Dennis, you've called him a, a friend for life. While media, you know, there's media reports uh, he's executed 340 of his inner circle since taking power uh, to solidify his control, including his uncle who was killed by extreme uh, version of the firing squad. Uh, and recent reports uh, that he recently killed his half brother in Malaysia uh, using VX nerve agent. Uh, so how do you reconcile your interactions with him from these media reports with him? Well, as I, I said, got, I got to ask you the hard question. Well, the hard question. I don't, like I said, I don't get into politics, you know, because what I've seen of him, it wasn't like that. It was like that we, uh, when I did my basketball game, I saw his, his, uh, his uh, cousin on the boat. I saw his uncle on the boat. His brother his, and sister. Brother and sister, they was on the boat with us. And they kept saying they, he executed a family. No, they wasn't. They were sitting right there in front of us. So, and those are the things that you, you read in the news, right? You read in the news, but you don't really actually go, you don't actually go see it eye to eye. But what he, what he does as far as politics, I got nothing to do with that. I have nothing to do with that. And I was telling, I was telling Trump, I said, you know, Trump, I was in his office, I said, Trump, I'm going to North Korea. He said, I want to go. That's the first thing he said, I want to go. <laughs> okay, so. so all right, Mr. President of the United States, you can go now. <laughs> you can go now. You're president now, right? So, I mean, you can make that work. But it's 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 just one of those things where it, it, it was very tough for me for a while because people was really, 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 really bad mouthing me because I they thought I betrayed Americans. And I'm like, no, it's not like that. It's not like that. And I think most of these young kids here don't realize that. What you see is what you, what you see on TV is not what you see in real life. So if you think that the marshal is a bad guy and he's killing everyone over there, okay, great. So I'm, I'm thinking the same thing about people in Cuba. I'm thinking people like people in Russia. I'm thinking people over here in China, Japan, you know, Asia, you know, stuff like that. Like I said, I'm not favoring him as, 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 as a leader or as a friend. I just think that, you know, People got to, you know, have a you know, little open mind a little bit because this is a, like what, 2017, social media and stuff like that. We're in a new era right now. We're in a new era, and for me, I think he's actually trying to change his culture. As we saw over there, he was like building new condos, building new apartments, building grocery stores. He's building all these new things for his country. So he's actually trying to do something for his country. So if we were to, if we have to go back over there again, you'll see it. Like I said before, too, it's not going to change. You know, it's not going to change quick. But with Dennis, it's a, you know, it's a small step in the right direction. Just his acceptance, you know, to <clears throat> more modernize, you know, their culture. You know, it's not going to happen. And, you know, might not happen in 10, 15, but maybe 30, 40. Who knows? Maybe tomorrow. But it's one step at a time. Yeah, I'll ask. Uh Couple, couple more before I get into the audience for some questions. So, you know, we, North Korea is probably one of the most isolated countries in the world. Um, we do see things like if the regime is conducting, you know, uh, ballistic missile tests or nuclear weapons tests, we can see that, see pictures of the, you know, grandiose military parades. And but we also hear stories about harsh uh, living conditions, malnourishment, starvation, entire population cut off from the information beyond the country's borders. Um, because there's so little transparency that we see that we don't really know what, the, uh, what, what it's like over there. So how would, you know, what was it like off camera? What, what, did, what was, the, for all of you, I mean, kind of what was your perception of how did that narrative match or mismatch with what you saw on the ground? Yeah, um, look, there's no denying that North Korea is an impoverished country, I mean, but there's been a significant amount of change in the situation there in the last four years since the, 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 the regime has changed. And I would say that what impresses me is every time I go back, there's better electrical, there's better electrical supplies now than there was a year ago, and that was better than a year before. There's, um, if you go to the stores there, there's a much more variety of foodstuffs than there was a few years ago. You, there's, there's, there's things are changing. And in many ways, I'm often surprised by how the ec economy is doing well despite all these sort of sanctions that are in place because there's a notable, noticeable change in terms of, as I said, like gasoline, electric, and other things, cars. There's now traffic jams in Pyongyang, and there didn't used to be very many cars at all. So whatever is happening over there, I mean, 
Yes, they're a poor country. Yes, there are cars that burn wood. Okay, but there's a lot fewer now than there were a few years ago. There's a lot more food supply now than there used to be. And while there have been major famines, like 94 to 96, a couple times in the 2000s, the situation's improving to some extent. Now, what can we do about that? You know, we don't have any ability to have any impact on what goes on in Korea if we don't have a presence there. If you don't have interaction with them, you can't have any influence. And one way to build these sort of things is to have more interactions, have people going there for science exchange, for sports, for music, for other things, where at least you're getting some interaction with the country. It would be nice if we had diplomatic relations so you can at least talk, because I was always raised to believe that the purpose of diplomacy is to prevent military conflicts, right? And I know nobody in this room, I know that officers in the military are the people that least want to actually have to use the skills that they develop in their career. And the way you avoid that is by trying to deal with these issues, trying to understand their perspective. And I ask everyone in this room to think about this for a minute. Let's assume for a moment that you are now in the North Korean military, not the American military. You're the experts on military policy. Think about what you would do differently than what they've done that you think would better secure the future of that place. And I think these are thought questions that you should go home and think about because you can't influence anything if you don't at least put yourself in their shoes. Think about it and then try to you know, deal with it. how do you improve quality of life there and for everybody else. All right, so I'm going, to I'm going to ask one final question. So if uh, for the audience, I think we're going to bring down a couple uh, microphones and kind of line up on the, on the aisles to, to, to answer them instead of us running around catching them. So they will, they're coming down here. So if you got a question, you can move down. But I will ask uh, Dennis one final question before uh, turning it over to the cadets. So obviously, like as you said, you know President Trump. You, uh, from the Celebrity Apprentice, obviously, <laughs> worked with him or for him there, I guess you could say. Uh, so if, 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 if he asked you to go back and conduct basketball diplomacy in official capacity, what would you tell President Trump? I'd be in a heartbeat because I got to say sports, sports is probably the number one thing on the planet that can actually heal, heal things at least for a day or two days a week or something like that. I mean, when I went there, um, I think the second time I went there, he was having a, uh, some type of uh, celebration in the stadium, remember? And he, he told me, he said, Dennis, this is for you. I said, what do you mean this is for me? He said, that's 150,000 people that's going to be in the stadium for, just for you. I'm like, you're kidding, right? So we drive up there, and all the people are in the parking lot. They're gonna do this big celebration. It's like the Olympics, you know, when they first start. It was just, it was just like that. 150,000 people in one stadium, and he said, "This is for you." Straight like that. I didn't want that. I just thought it's for him. But for to see somebody like that to have that much power, I was impressed. Now we, we can be enemies all we want, but I'm saying to see that much power in, in one man's hand. And we just see the people, how much they love that little, that little guy. <laughs> that, that little guy. I mean, just to see him when he, when, when he walks in the door, it, it's just it's insane. I was amazed because I'm like, these people were standing up for a half an hour and clapped the whole time. And you see people crying the whole time. You see people crying for this man. And it's like, and he's only like 35 years old. And um, he does have power, but I think the power of being is the people around him. That's pretty much what it is right there. But uh, like I said, you know, we're friends at that extent as far as athletes and basketball. That is it. No more, no, no, no more politics. Just that's that part right there. And so I can't say no to that. The president say this, could you go over there and, and do some basketball, you know, events over there? I say, absolutely. All right, so we'll turn it over, but I'll remind uh, anybody out there with the, the cameras and, and any recording devices, turn those off at this time. We want to have the, uh, all, all the uh, Q&A off the record so the uh, cadets and uh, faculty can be freer to ask questions and our panelists can be freer to answer the uh, questions. So uh, off the record, so not even for attribution. <laughs> 